Well, I like to uh, come in ready for a message with those words, and the Lord spit, had the whale spit Jonah up on the beach. The big fish vomited, it says in the scripture. Can start a sermon with vomiting, how's that? No, better not. All right, this is the last installment of our series. Uh, we've, been, we've been following a series called Under the Waterline and seeing how the foundational stories of, of the Bible, in particular in uh, Genesis, and, uh, and, and today we're looking at Jonah, but these are well, well-known stories. And we dig deep, and we see fresh insight that always is dealing with our everyday life, the reality of who we are. And this is thousands of years later, which just is, is one of the things that's shocking about Scripture. Scripture is so relevant. It's one of the reasons we know that we can be faithful to the truth of God's Word describes us exactly who we are. We looked at Cain and Abel, where envy and revenge bring about violence and innocent suffering. This becomes our legacy as the first human born on earth murders the second. Then we looked at Noah and how God does a reboot with the flood and he chooses one family and one group of animals to continue his blessing and renew the world. Next we looked at Jacob whom God uses in spite of the flawed life that he lives. And Jacob becomes the father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And last week we see that one of those sons, Joseph, battles his own narcissism, his own immaturity, and he grows in faith. And he becomes the savior of God's people from famine and destruction. Not just God's people, but all the people of the land, the Egyptians and the Canaanites. And we're going to join Joseph at the end of his life next week in the new series, but we'll see what happens next week. So, in the meantime, as we study our last foundation story, we're introduced to Jonah. Now, as with Noah, this is a popular children's story, as you you, uh, joined me with with our preschool and, and the accounts of of the big fish who swallows the man and all that makes for a great storytelling opportunity. But actually, the story of Jonah in Scripture is quite profound. I want to see why. So I want you to look at this next slide. That this is, of course, the Sistine Chapel. And this famous chapel is in Vatican City, and it's filled with amazing art. Just a beautiful place. I was there with my wife and, and a bunch of people from here locally in the valley as, as we went to, uh, we, we took a, a trip to Rome and uh, I was in the Sistine Chapel and, and you're not allowed to take pictures, okay? That's absolutely forbidden. And I had a, a new iPhone and I thought, you know what I'll do is I'll secretly just put my iPhone right here and then I'll turn it on video so I could at least have videos of the ceiling. And so I walked into this kind of a dark room, and sure enough, I turn it on, and I didn't realize it has automatic light when it's dark on the video, and my light turns on, and the Italian police instantly, with their machine gun, one of the guys runs up and starts yelling at me in Italian. He he grabs at my phone, and before he can get it, I put it on, uh, on, you know, I I press the button so it goes back to, uh, you know, to the default mode, which is a picture of of, uh, our granddaughter. And so he's looking at it, and he says, you cannot take a picture. He's ready to confiscate it. Then he sees her, and she's so cute, so he gives it to me back. Well, not really. But uh, anyway, I've learned my lesson as a, uh, as a tour person in uh, the Sistine Chapel. But here's, here's what's interesting about this. You could see, whenever, I mean, the Sistine Chapel is not a museum for art, it wasn't meant for that. Michelangelo is painting the interior of a sanctuary of a house of worship. And when I look at this picture, I'm gonna do what all of us would do 
when you come into a house of worship, eventually your eyes, which will go everywhere in this picture, right? When you're in the Sistine Chapel, they'll go everywhere, but eventually you face the altar. And you imagine what worship is like in this amazing place. How would anybody ever be able to pay attention? Every single piece of art is priceless. But you do face the altar because the altar represents where Jesus is. And in particular for Holy Communion, this is Jesus in person with us in worship. So what do you see when you look at the altar of the Sistine Chapel? Well, look at this next slide. I'll give a more close-up. There's Jesus. He has risen from the dead, and now he has conquered. He is the victor. And if I keep looking up, who is that big, huge guy right above him? Yep, it's Jonah. Jonah? Why Jonah? Why is Jonah so central? Well, that's the kind of question we can keep asking ourselves again and again because the story of Jonah is one of the best known stories in, in the world. This little two page story in my Bible says something in a profound way about who we are as people. You see, the story of Jonah is actually a mystery. We don't know who the author is. We don't know when the story was written down. It could be anywhere from the 8th century to the 3rd century BC. And is it a parable? Is it a parable like Jesus told parables that, that teaches a key point like Jesus might use? Well, no, it's not really like his parables because Jesus' parables are brief and they're straight to the point. Jonah is a complex story with a lot of layers and, and has many different key lessons. In fact, today I'm only going to focus on one of them. You go back and read Jonah and you'll find a dozen more. So is Jonah history? Well, yes. I mean, Jesus speaks of Jonah in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew. He talks about Jonah and he speaks of Jonah as if he's a historical person. At the same time, Jonah is not written as history for history's sake. Jonah is written in a didactic way. That's a fancy word. It just simply means written to teach important lessons. And sure enough, Jonah directly applies to our lives today. You see, if you want real life, listen to this. The Lord gave his message to Jonah, son of Amittai, get up and go to the great city of Nineveh. Announce my judgment against it, because I have seen how wicked its people are. Jonah, your assignment, get to Nineveh. Next slide. That's Nineveh, all those words. Nineveh is a place of corruption. Uh, Nineveh, in, in, in present day, it, it would be located in Iraq. And, and so it's about as far east as you're going to go in Jonah's day. And it's a city, capital city of Assyria. And the people of Nineveh are known for their violence and being godless and, and being corrupt and being uh, just everything that would go against the ways of God. In fact, Nineveh is such a godless city of corruption that it's singled out by God. It's seen by God, we're told. And actually, it's also heard by God. That, that word here, um, I have seen how wicked, that word for wickedness or evil in, in the Hebrew is raha. Ra'a, and ra'a means a loud noise. That's the, that's the most ancient root, a loud noise. What does that remind you of? Chaos. Inside and out, Nineveh is a place of corruption and chaos. 
And evil actions are taken by people bent on evil themselves. And those actions might be done in secret, whispers in the shadows. But on the other hand, those who are bent on doing evil may be loud and screaming in rage, heard around the world, heard in the heavens. Nineveh is corrupt. And where there is corruption, there is always chaos. So what does Jonah do when he faces his assignment? Let's get even closer to home. What do you do? Yes, you. You see, we all face corruption in our lives when things just aren't right. You may be facing corruption right now in your life where you're not being treated fairly, where, where things are out of balance and you're facing evil and corruption. It doesn't have to be a city. It doesn't have to be a nation. Of course, there's a lot of corruption in cities and nations, isn't there? But the thing we know about corruption is that it doesn't get any better unless you address it. So what do you do? You have a choice. You can join in with the corruption, and many times that's what people end up doing. We end up playing along with it, trying to convince ourselves that it's not bad, this is the way it should be, and uh, I want a piece of that pie. I want part of what's coming out of that corruption. It doesn't work too well when you have the God of justice and the God of peace. So can you run away? Do you go along? Well, what about running away? Running away from chaos. I mean, if you ignore it, maybe it will go away. Will, will it get better if you just do nothing? Well, let's see. But Jonah got up and went in the opposite direction in order to get away from the Lord. Hint, dumb idea. He went down to the seacoast, to the port of Joppa, where he found a ship leaving for Tarshish. All right, so that's, they, they figure that's Spain. <laughs> so he's going to go to the far western edge of known world in his time rather than go to the far eastern edge. In other words, trying to get as far away from the problem as possible. He went down to that sea coast. He bought a ticket and he went on board hoping by going away to the west he could escape from the Lord. But we know you can't escape from the Lord. And sure enough, as the ship was sailing along, suddenly the Lord flung a powerful wind over the sea, causing a violent storm that threatened to send them to the bottom. Fearing for their lives, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. That's what it looks like. And you know, Jonah, trying to avoid the problem, the longer that you try to avoid it, the longer that we procrastinate, the heavier the seas, the more chaos, the more uncertainty. And that's what happens. Procrastinate, problems don't go away, they multiply. The chaos gets worse. Jonah is running away from his God-given destiny. Work against the corruption. But that's not going too well. You see, God wants to bring shalom into our lives. God wants our lives to be in harmony where his ways are our ways. And no matter what the storms that are brewing around us, we go straight ahead right in the middle of those storms and we're guided by God, our true north on the, on the compass. See, things will always get worse 
if they could have been dealt with before they come, become even more and more chaotic. Running away from what you know you should be dealing with doesn't help you feel any better. It just makes things a whole lot worse. And so Jonah, he decides to give up. So here's what happens. Next slide. He gets thrown overboard. Why? Well, fearing for their lives, as I said, the, the desperate sailors shouted to their gods for help and threw the cargo overboard to lighten the ship. And all this time, Jonah was sound asleep down in the hold. Ah, he can stay away from the fray. So the captain went down after him. How can you sleep at a time like this, he shouted. Get up and pray to your God. Maybe he will have mercy on us and spare our lives. Mercy and spare our lives. And then the crew cast lots to see which of them have it offended the gods and caused the terrible storm. When they did this, Jonah lost the toss, the toss of the dice. What have you done to bring this awful storm down on us, they demanded. Who are you? What is your line of work? What country are you from? What is your nationality? And Jonah answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. Then he told them he was running away from the Lord. The sailors were terrified when they heard this. Oh, why did you do it, they groaned. And since the storm was getting worse all the time, they asked him, what should we do to stop this storm? Throw me into the sea, Jonah says, and it will become calm again, for I know that this terrible storm is all my fault. Instead, the sailors tried even harder to row the boat ashore, but the stormy sea was too violent for them, and they couldn't make it. And they cried out to the Lord, Jonah's God. They said, oh Lord, they pleaded, don't make us die for this man's sin, responsible for his death, because it isn't our fault, O oh Lord. You have sent this storm upon him for your own good reasons. Then the sailors picked Jonah up, and they threw him into the raging sea, and the storm stopped at once. The sailors were awestruck by the Lord's great power, and they offered him a sacrifice and vowed to serve him. Now the Lord had arranged for a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was inside the fish for three days and three nights. Notice how Jonah is sleeping through the chaos. That sound familiar? Remember Jesus in the storm on the Sea of Galilee? But unlike Jesus being asleep during the storm, Jonah can't just tell the wind and the waves to be quiet. Jonah can't shush them. He tells the sailors, throw me overboard. So they do. And the storm stops. And Jonah is in the belly of the whale belly of the big fish. And the reason that we say whale a lot is because a whale is just a cuter animal than a big fish. So you'll see here, I mean, come on. How, I love that picture. This is a plush toy you can buy right now online. And, and the whale has a nice smile, and Jonah has a smile like, hello, friend whale, let's go play. No, that's not what really happened. Okay, next slide. That's the big fish. And the big fish had Jonah. And he's there in his belly for three days and he gets three days to think about his decision making. He gets three days to think about his destiny. Will he follow God's command or not? That's a question we ask ourselves. When you're facing corruption, when you're facing bad stuff happening around you, will you follow God's command and face corruption head on? we see that Jonah is starting to see the light. The light in the midst of darkness. I mean, think of the, the motif here, how amazing this picture is. It's, it's Jonah in the belly of this big fish in the dark, and he realizes that he needs a savior. 
It's like our symbol for baptism. When we, when we, we speak of baptism, it's like Jonah is dying to himself as we die to ourselves. When we're baptized, and in in, 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 he dies to himself in the waters of chaos. And he comes out fresh, ready to follow God and aim to bring God's ways into the world, even if he has to follow God's instructions to face corruption directly. You see, when we face the corruption that surround us, surrounds us with God's power, when we don't go along and we don't run away, the world around us changes. And sure enough, we see what happens in Nineveh. Jonah returns. Next slide. He returns and he, and he gives God's message. And it's a message of hope. Then the Lord spoke to Jonah a second time. Get up and go to the great city of Nineveh and deliver the message of judgment I have given you. And so the Lord calls it a judgment, but it's a judgment that is wrapped like a gift. It's wrapped in repentance, in opportunity, wrapped in God's mercy. And sure enough, they open that gift. So Jonah obeyed the Lord's command. He went to Nineveh. It's a city so large it took three days, three days for him to kind of tell everyone in Nineveh. I mean, I imagine in my mind's eye, he's going house to house. And, and on the day that he enters the city, he shouts to the crowds again and again, 40 days from now, Nineveh will be destroyed. So he's going to this wicked city, huge city, by himself. As a prophet of God, he is bold. And yes, Jonah is showing a, quite a, a, a small bit of courage, don't you think? And sure enough, the people of Nineveh realize their sin. They realize that they've missed the mark. They realize that in their corruption and in the evil actions they're taking, they're going to pay a price. They will be destroyed. And yet, here's how they respond. The people of Nineveh believed God's message, and from the greatest to the least, they decided to go without food and wear sackcloth to show their sorrow. And when the king of Nineveh heard what Jonah was saying, he stepped down from his throne, and he took off his royal robes. He dressed himself in sackcloth and sat on a heap of ashes. And the king had sent this decree throughout the city, no one, not even the animals, may eat or drink anything at all. That's a big fast. Everyone is required to wear sackcloth and pray earnestly to God. Everyone must turn from their evil ways and stop all their violence, including the king. Who can tell, he says, perhaps even yet God will have pity on us and hold back his fierce anger from destroying us. And sure enough, that's exactly what happens. When God saw that they had put a stop to their evil ways, he had mercy on them and didn't carry out the destruction he had threatened. Do you want evil to stop? Do you want corruption to come to an end? Well, Jonah discovers what we can all learn. If God is calling you to face what's wrong in life, in particular your own life, if he's calling you to face it head on, God will give you what you need to get through it. This is our destiny. Now, my destiny 
as an individual may be different than yours. The corruption and, and, and the things that aren't right in the life around me, I need to face those things head on. You need to face your Ninevehs head on. Because joining in with what we know is wrong is only going to lead to chaos and it's only going to get worse. And procrastinating, thinking that if you do nothing long enough, things will get better on their own. They never get better on their own. The chaos becomes overwhelming. And things get way, way worse. How about you let God give it a go in your life? How about you have enough courage to do what God wants and follow your destiny to make the world better rather than worse? Wouldn't that be something? If simply the Christians in our nation would dedicate their lives to making things better rather than worse, and you'll know what that's like. When things are better, God shows up in amazing ways. When thing gets, things get worse, what happens is you end up in the belly of a whale. And it doesn't seem as if God is around at all. Have enough courage to do what God wants to do through you. You can, because someone greater than Jonah did just that. Let's look at the Sistine Chapel again. There he is, the victor, the conqueror, the one who bursts out of his tomb, the one who comes out of the grave and sets us free, sets us free to be the kind of people who can face whatever is corrupt, whatever is evil around us, can face it directly, and through the power of Jesus, can bring about the change necessary day by day to where the things that we want are the things that God wants. And harmony even in the midst of awful situations of life. Harmony, shalom, peace can be yours. In the midst of all the chaos and evil in the world, Jesus was thrown, but he wasn't thrown into the sea. He was thrown on a cross. He was giving a sacrifice, not a sacrifice like Jonah, a man who's running away from God, but the sacrifice of one who runs to Jerusalem. And the innocent man is killed. He is murdered on that cross. But that isn't the end. The grave can't hold him. And he bursts free. See, Jesus is alive. Nineveh and all the Ninevehs of the world are given the same invitation from Jesus. Turn away from your corruption. Turn to the one, the only one, who can set you free before it's too late. Amen.